Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today, we are you know, blessed with the presence of Lee Brown, who, if you have not heard of Lee Brown, you're going to get everything you've ever imagined today. She is amazing. Um, we're really lucky to have you here, Lee. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank well, you. I'm very honored to join y'all because I miss my Canucks. I hadn't been up there in a couple of years and my poor son is a Jays fan. So, you know, he doesn't have much joy in Mudville these days. Oh. <laughs> well, the border's open, so you can come anytime now. Yes. You're, you're, you're good now. Well, maybe one day. I think I can't quite come across the border yet, but maybe one day I can. Maybe one day. So, so give us, give us a really quick, you know, background to kind of how you got to be here today. Like, tell us some of your, your background. So because those of y'all that don't know me that didn't care enough to Google still probably don't care, I'll tell you something interesting. And those of y'all that did look it up, I'll tell you too. I'm a 22 year realtor, cause yes, I got in in 2000. So I can do that math cause I'm a realtor and math is not our strong suit. And I also own a brokerage, but prior to real estate, I sold chainsaws, I sold stocks and bonds. I lived in Manhattan and it was a sketchy part of town at the time. Of course it's probably sketchy again now. And then before that, I weighted tables and because right now this is april 4th this is the national championship i'm wearing my carolina blue and when i was waiting tables in college i had to wait on the evil coach k and all his little sorry duke basketball players so watching them get beat on saturday night by my team was the pinnacle of happiness in my life and so i say go to hell duke that's my joy in life and i love carolina and this is totally not related to real estate, right? But I've sold a blue million houses. I've worked with buyers and sellers and I've got my crazy shit in real estate podcast because where else do you talk about finding an IV bag on the breakfast room light fixture because you can't talk about that in polite society. So that's who I am. I'm a North Carolina girl who sells houses and have lived a lot of life actually. So we could, we could go in lots of rabbit holes, but you probably want to talk about real estate. Well, but you're also pretty involved with organized real estate, right? I would say I'm pretty involved. I was the vice president of the National Association of Realtors last year in 2021 under President Charlie Opler. I was the vice president of advocacy, which of course is the side of the association that focuses on community involvement and focuses on political advocacy, because if nobody realizes it right now, the impact on real estate from elected officials is far bigger than anything our financial institutions do or our buyers and sellers want to do. And so as professionals, we have to not just pay attention to what they're doing in our state capitals, our local city halls, and in the national capitals. We have to be the one who picks up the phone and says, you people are a bunch of morons and this needs to stop. Although you kind of have to say it nicer, except their staff is all 23 years old and just got their political science degree. So you can be as nice to them as you need to. But that's a really important role. And it's why I volunteer because I, I can't let my business be dictated by people who haven't conducted real estate in 40 years without my clients having a voice at the table, which is what I do when I volunteer. So long answer to your question, but I've been involved at the national level for little over a decade, so about half of my career. And then I'll be the state president for North Carolina Realtors next year. So I'm now focused on doing some things here in these 100 counties. So you're kind of switched on and, you know, in the big picture realtor spaces, is, is, is the realtor under attack? Uh, commission models, brokerage models, employee models, it, it, everything we have that's a model, excluding the super models, is under attack. So what's going on? So let's blame Australia. Okay, so Australia can be blamed for a lot of this because their real estate model is what consumer protection groups, and I'll say, I'll put the little quotation marks on that, consumer protection. It's a bunch of old retired white dudes in Washington, D.C. who want to determine what real estate looks like. And I'm still not convinced any of them have ever bought and sold a house. And I really want to hold up a therapy doll to them and say, show me on the doll where the realtor hurt you because they're so angry all the time. But they love that Australian model. The Australian model, though, is not consumer friendly. It is a model where a listing agent can list a house and not let a buyer agent ever in. There is no buyer agency. And so buyers, if you want to buy a house, you don't have a pure MLS, which is a free market. You've got to go knock on doors, beg a listing agent to let you in. And then God help you if you don't like what the seller's asking for, there's nobody to fight for you and be in your corner. 
our consumer protection groups in the US and in Canada as well, so they work in concert, they don't really like buyer agency because they believe it adds cost to the transaction. Forgetting that there is a fee for buyer agency, but it helps the buyer know what do you do when you make an offer? Should I do an appraisal? What about inspections? Is this a good neighborhood? What are property values like? How do I negotiate a mortgage? Like all the things that we do for our buyers to help them put together all the pieces so they can make a wise purchase. And the government agencies want to wipe out buyer agency on the guise of saving money. And it's not always about the end dollar because let's be real, any buyer agency fee is paid by the consumer. It's just currently baked into the price in a way that the consumer can afford it because their dollars go to their down payment, their dollars go to deposits. They just don't have extra cash laying around. So that's the direction that we are seeing a push for from our bureaucrats and our elected officials. But again, it's because for most of them, they just haven't conducted real estate in so long, they're disconnected from it. But the average human goes through a real estate transaction three, maybe four times in their life. And so over that 50 years of adult life, you do it so infrequently that you may forget you paid somebody for a very valuable service. But five years later, you're thinking, man, I paid them too much money. Well, that's also the disconnect from realtors who have failed to communicate with people after the transaction to show their value in an ongoing fashion. Because in five years, if your clients have forgotten you and thus they don't defend you, part of that fault has to lie on us. And so I can only be aggravated with these consumer protection groups if I'm also aggravated with how we have failed to message to the public what a realtor does and the value that we provide in an ongoing fashion, which by the way, most agents do. They're talking to people, here's a painter, here's a contractor, yes, you should refi. Most agents are doing that in some way, but it's just not a consistent platform. And so because of those two failures, there is an attack on real estate. There is a drive to get rid of the multiple listing services that have made our two countries so successful in real estate is that access to a free market of information so that when I list a house, every agent's buyers can see it. And when my buyers are looking, they can see everything in the market. Every other country on earth is so jealous of our multiple listing service because we have a true open marketplace and our government wants to make that a regulated utility. Well, that's not what it is. It's not about the data points. What that multiple listing service is, is the three of us as professionals agreeing to cooperate with each other so that our net clients will be best served. It's an amazing resource. And if we don't get really, really active right now, all of us, we could possibly lose that. And that's not good for our neighbors or the it's market. Not, it's not good for the whole industry, right? So, you know, maybe, you know, you started 20 years ago. I started 17 something years ago. Um, we were holding the data. You know, we were, it was hard for a consumer to shop on their own, get the information and all that stuff. And that's completely changed there, you know, in, in Canada, you know, the U S a whole bunch of other areas, it, we're not data keepers anymore. We don't, I don't care. I don't want to be the data keeper. I want to help people navigate the transaction. Yes. I want to make sure they get a fair deal. And then when I look at the Australian model, that's held up and, and it's held up here as well. And um, right from the federal government on down, you know, let's look at this model. Their prices have increased the same amount on average as ours were more in an, a frustrating, um, you know, environment where, you know, if we were just to flip a switch, you know, uh, changes where, you know, uh, um, uh, problems can happen, right? So if we switch to this model right away tomorrow, what would the market look like? Uh, and in Canada or in Ontario anyway, or in our area, auctions are unregulated, completely zero regulation. So all of a sudden you have maybe the auction house is bidding against you and you don't, Canadians aren't used to auctions. And so you'd, there'd be a steep learning curve on how to protect yourself without maybe an agent helping you protect yourself. So the change right, because really what you're saying is so true. We'll bleed agents, but you're also going to have this whole class of consumers that finds themselves just boxed out because they, they will not know what to do next. And let's be honest, Jody. The consumer that gets hurt the most is not the one percenter. It's not the super wealthy. It's the regular person who's trying to figure out 
I got to be at work tomorrow. I got to pick up the kids from daycare. We're out of space. We'd like to get closer to work. They're juggling a very busy life on a budget. If the market shifts overnight, which is what's happening right now, they're going to be the ones that get left behind because prices will continue to go up and they're still here and here's prices. And now no opportunity for financial stability, no opportunity to put their dog out in a yard and paint the bedroom. Yeah, yeah agreed. So we don't have to talk about equality, right? So that's always a conversation in today's world is everything's got to be equal. Well, your starting line should be equal. If you take buyer agents out of the transaction, if you eliminate the MLS, then there is no equal starting line for buyers. Not everybody will have access to the same houses. Not everybody will know what to do next. And we already have that out there because not all realtors are created equal. I do believe that this year and beyond is the realtor with the skill set is the one that's going to really knock the cover off the wall. The realtors who have not gotten educated and aren't paying attention will go away. And that's, that's fine. Frankly, a lot of them who have chosen mediocrity, let them go. But that still leaves a coverage gap for our neighbors who need to buy a house. And we have to think about our first houses, right? So it was affordable when I bought my first house. It was still a stretch because I was single and didn't have a ton of money, but I could do it. Now, I don't know how somebody who's wanting to stretch could even do it. You have, almost have to have a pot of money or somebody backing you to make it happen. Yeah. What do, and so uh, very recently, I believe NAR came out with some rules that said, you know, exclusive listings are bad, which goes to exactly what you're saying is, you know, uh, selling properties and, and not marketing them to the fullest, not exposing them, you know, to the partners in, in the neighborhood and, and other buyers is bad. And now we're going to go to a system deliberately where don't, you know, only promote it while you're standing on the front door. And shout as loud as you can, and that might be it. And that would be acceptable, right? Oh my gosh, I just had the best visual of a little video of a realtor standing at the front door yelling and calling out their marketing plan. And that's sadly <laughs> what we're going to see fill up Instagram and TikTok in that dystopian future you just painted. But think about this. The Part of the reason our MLSs came into vogue all these years ago was because of the exclusive offices. The buyer who you knew from church asked you, I heard there's a house for sale over here. You're like, well, it's not my office. No way of knowing you call, they block you. And so the person who trusts you, which is how most realtors build their businesses with trust with their neighbors, you can't get that person to help you because they got blocked. Well, it makes the whole profession look terrible. I mean, we already are perceived as a bunch of commission grubbing bloodsuckers that really don't care about anything but money. And so if you go to this exclusive office environment again, then you're going to be in a space where they do think all we care about is money. And I hear the argument. I already know where it's coming in from the other side of the internet because my mom ears work. But Lee, my clients want privacy. Okay, liar. They are really just looking for their more their convenience, right? And so we can, as professionals, find a way to guard somebody's privacy while still exposing that property to the market. But as hard as it is to acknowledge, buyers in a real estate market should have access to all the information so that they get to decide a seller who says, I'm only going to sell to a couple of my neighbors and nobody else. Really? That's not great for the market. No. So, so it's, it's 2022. We're coming out of COVID. Um, what's next? What, like where, where are the agents right now, right. That are selling what's next. What are we, what are we dealing with? What are we looking at? How do they survive the next little bit? Well, the first thing is they have to know that no matter what the market's doing, houses are bought and sold. Bought and sold. It was during the Great Depression when my granddaddy bought several hundred of our acres from my family farm. He bought them on the courthouse steps in the foreclosure auction in 1928, all right? That's how long I've lived where I live. And so he was he scratched his money together to do it. That was the worst economic time ever. He was able to buy real estate. Somebody was able to sell. We've obviously seen a lot of run-up in the last couple of years. And so because there's been so much run-up, it's this... <sighs> When's it going to crash? When's it going to crash? Like we can brace ourselves against a crash when markets are really living and breathing beings. They're, they're very alive. We, we don't know when it's going to have a heart attack and flatline. Who knows? It might just 
have a hiccup and fall down on the sidewalk. We don't know. But because you don't know, if you remember in your head that houses are always bought and sold, land, condos, commercial building, always bought and sold, what you have to learn is to accept that the market moves. And so for my agents, for myself, for anybody I know, the answer to any real estate question is it depends. Should I sell right now? It depends. Should I buy right now? It depends. It's not always a blanket yes or no. And I find that realtors right now, if somebody asks them, should I sell? Or they will say yes. Why? Because they need a listing. However, the person who's selling will find it easy to sell right now in the grand scheme of things, but where will they go? And if it's that person who does need to capture their equity and stockpile it, yes, you should sell. But if you're selling because you want to play up and move up in the market, all right, let's talk pros and cons because there's always pros and cons. They may yet want to do it. They may not. A truly professional realtor doesn't broad brush and says it depends. With buyers right now, I'm a risk averse person just by nature. I don't live in a lot of risk. I've been sitting on some liquid cash for three years now because I have felt very uneasy about the heights of the market. How much money have I left on the table by cashing out in 2019? We weren't going to talk about that. That's okay. Because when the market does go down at some point in the future, 12, 24, 36 months, who knows, I'll be prepared to take advantage of it. But that's how I live. Some of your buyers want to have that same opportunity. They're waiting for it to go down. That's cool. As long as you know, we don't know when it is. I got your back. I don't know if we should sell now. Is it going to go up? I don't know. It depends, right? So when you're the realtor who can say that and know where you are risk-wise, know what the markets can look like, you become a ridiculously trusted professional because most realtors can't stop themselves from, it's always a great time to buy or sell a house or post it on Instagram, sold this house in five minutes with 483 offers. I'm amazing. All right. So if you're posting that stuff, you've basically told the consumer that you're not worth a toot. If you're the realtor who can look somebody in the eye and say, it depends, they're going to keep coming back to you to say, talk to me, tell me more. How do, how do I make a decision? Well, you'll have a job forever if you're able to guide people in those conversations. It, it really is. It's just asking for more information, right? It depends. It's just that, that, Hey, okay, well, I need more information to help you do my job better. And, and it shows you as the professional then, right? It's not just saying, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Always. Sell. Totally. Totally yeah. sell. I can sell it in a minute. Okay, great. I can get a Home Depot sign too. Right. But the question becomes, where do they go? And I don't know about y'all, but in my market, the every realtor I talk to who's been in for more than five minutes has a whole list of people who want to sell, but they have nowhere to go. And so the minute that the pipeline starts to unlock a little bit, I think we're going to see a quickening of the market. I just don't know what it's going to take for that to happen. And that's the, that's the reason we have to continue having conversations because when it unlocks, you better be the first one to the table. Because one thing we learned in 07, when the recession went on, is if it took you too long to react, then you were always chasing a ball downhill. If you reacted fairly quickly, you could be in front of the ball and get somebody safely in and out of the market before it got away from them. And I don't say that to be negative. I say that because you have to have some realist about you in this business and if you're watching this or listening to this and you are a new -er realtor, you are early in your career, for the love of all that's holy, you've got to find a mentor who's been in the business more than 10 years who can walk you through what to expect in a changing market. I don't know when or how it's going to change, but real estate is cyclical. So get yourself mentally and skill set prepared before it gets here. So even in 07, 08, though, the speed of the decline was, was drastic but the speed of the recovery was just as drastic. And so when people were waiting, oh, it, you know, uh, I'll, I'll wait, I'm gonna catch the bottom, I'm gonna keep, you know, uh, like, you know, we saw, we saw a less dramatic uh, valley here in Canada, but I mean, it was over before you blinked and people that were trying to time the market, by the time, you know, all those people that said, oh, I'm waiting for this, when you called them, oh no, it, it's not the right time. You know, there's a lot of timing and different investments and things, but, you know, especially if it's your home, there's very little timing involved in that. You know, the timing involved is your family life cycle more than trying to time a market. And you know, in, my, in my career, you know, more or less interest rates have just gone straight down more, you know, in a bumpy way, but 
you know, my first mortgage was 7% and my last mortgage was one point something percent, um, you know, and so you, you know, you're talking about finding a realtor that has 10 years experience, maybe find someone with 30 years experience, because, you know, even I haven't seen what going up, you know, the return to from two to 7% looks like or whatever the next five or 10 years looks like, it's going to be a different ride. And I'm not even sure some people know how to write the conditions and terms in a contract that, uh, you know, we used to do. So it'll be interesting to see how that part goes. Oh, they don't because they've been riding the wave, right? So it became a get a living, breathing person on the hook. And if you write enough offers, you'll sell one. And if you get a listing, it will sell. But they're going to have to probably learn seller financing. Are we going to have mortgages that can be assumed? I don't know of a lot of realtors who can explain an assumable mortgage. And it's not that a realtor has to know all the skinny, but you better have a lender partner who can. And so now might be a good time to talk to your lender partner about those financing things that are going to come up as the market shifts because I mean, it's, it's just wild, right? So historically over 50 years, the average 30 year fixed interest rate hovers around six and a half percent. We've been in a free money environment basically since 2008 and it just now is starting to move up. Well, my first mortgage was 11 and three quarters and I was so glad to get that loan because I got my house. We have to have that mindset too that says, it almost doesn't matter what the interest rates are doing It's what does it mean to your budget and if you're cool with your budget, then I'm cool with helping you. We got this, friend. But to still tell people 5% now is still historically below average, yeah. you done good. And if you were even at seven, you were just above the average. It only matters when you look at the monthly nut because of what you just said. I love that phrase, the family life cycle. Yeah. Things change. Like it makes me physically sad right now to talk to old people who can't downsize because there's nothing to downsize into. And they really don't want a giant house anymore because the kids are gone. They would like to get in the RV and go. And we have to be ready to help them when that day does come. And are we, and the, the next part of the conversation, the squeeze we've had in the last few years, are we building the stuff we need to live in? Are we building the stuff we want to live in? You know, what, I mean, it, that conversation is happening everywhere. And, you know, I think every, every, everyone's pointing the finger at everyone else not building not enough real estate agents just made the prices go up the you know city council somebody's not allowing anyone to build stuff Where, where's my tiny house you know like what whatever like we, you know we're not allowed to put a tiny house anywhere around here we're just having that conversation in our local group uh you know so what are we supposed to do with all this stuff i mean it's uh, i feel like we're at a funny space where we're kind of stuck we are supposed to have some perspective around us as realtors we have to elevate up beyond the sign in the yard and say let's look at the big picture here we have increasing demand which is where the prices have come from and if you can show me the realtor who controls the prices that's who i need to hang out with because that's a giant amount of power and i love power so yeah we don't have that power right I, realtors don't take somebody's little hand and force them to sign their offer to purchase right we just we're facilitating so we need to take ourselves out of the guilt space and realtors are quick to assign their own guilt to each other. I think the biggest problems right now are affiliated with the supply chain. The cost of materials is crazy. So if you follow me online, you know, I have my little chicken flock and I've, I've added chickens this year because I needed to. And we were expanding. It's chicken our math, right? It's always chicken math is what happens. Chicken math is crazy because we were going to have 10 and now we have 48. And so my husband might be a little unhappy with me right now, but I'll point out that he's naming them. And so this is on him too. But we had to expand our coop and our run. PVC is cheaper than lumber right now. And I'm like, this is bizarro world. There's no way that a petroleum-based product that's man-made should be cheaper than what God made in a tree. This is weird. So we expanded it with PVC, but you start to see those things. And a lot of the public, they stay in their houses longer now. So they stay in the house 10 years. They don't understand how the cost of goods has gone up. So they can't make that connection to why the cost of real estate is higher. But then it's easy to blame builders and developers. You can't blame builders and developers because they can't work for net zero. So then you realize they're, they're doing the best they can, right? The big money right now in real estate, frankly, is getting raw dirt and getting it ready, getting the grading done, site prep, and then turn it into buildable lots and then sell it and don't mess with the building process. That's where the money can be made. But the problem starts there because the biggest problem we have 
is our local governments. And here's why I blame our local governments. They will cave to the first yelly voice on Twitter, even if it's somebody with no followers and 18 digits past their name and an egg for a head. That person said, I don't want no low income housing over here. And then city officials who are a bunch of weaklings on the whole say, oh, well, people are upset with me. Nobody will vote for me. So I'm going to vote it down. Like, are you serious? You've got to be able to look at the bigger picture. So realtors need to be in the room. So whenever there's a planning and zoning meeting or a city council meeting or any kind of a provincial meeting, realtors need to be in there to hear the conversations, to discuss why we need to have socioeconomic diversity. That's the biggest diversity we need in our market right now is socioeconomic diversity so that there is attainable housing for every price point. If you are somebody in the service industry, you ain't buying anything right now and there's nothing you can rent either. It doesn't mean there shouldn't be something in the marketplace but our local officials are the ones that add all the zoning regs. They add the regulatory overload and the cost of permits. So take the supply chain cost, take the labor cost, and now add permit and regulatory fees. Well, no wonder developers don't want to fool with it because the, it's, it's so many thousands and thousands of dollars. It's absolutely crazy. And here's an example I can give you that's slightly dated because we don't have updated information since COVID because nothing seems to be accurate since COVID started, but in the state of Washington, the average new construction house has 47,000 American dollars in permitting and regulatory fees. That's the average house, which means that it hits the lower price points in a far more awful way than the swanky luxury houses. Well, that's why nobody builds the cheap stuff they can't afford to, which means that you as a realtor need to A, show up, and B, you need to put your neighbor hat on and say, you know what? I rely on the Instacart people to bring me my supper. I better make sure they got somewhere to live because with gas prices, how are they going to afford to keep doing all these deliveries that the work from home class is accustomed to? But we have a failure of imagination to see beyond ourselves. So what I would suggest that realtors think about Yes, look at tiny houses, look at creative solutions like that, look at accessory dwelling units where you could take a detached garage and bring in some plumbing and some heat and air and Shazam, you've got a granny apartment to think about how a single family lot could be rezoned for a duplex or a triplex or a quad because we know that with residential financing, that loan that you're qualified for is a one to four loan so we should have more quads here and there. And then the people who come in and say, not in my backyard, maybe they would shut up once in a while if it was one fourplex in the neighborhood and not just a whole sea of gigantic hedge fund owned apartments. But it's about getting out of our own way. And, and we all have biases. That's our nature as humans. You want to hang out with people that you either want to be like or that are just like you. And that applies to our real estate choices, too. But we have to be thinking about more options and short term rentals, the Airbnb phase. Realtors should be fighting tooth and nail to stop regulations on those because, in most markets, Airbnbs are not primarily used by frat parties, which is the reputation they've gotten because, oh, it's narrative driven by a few squeaky wheels on freaking Twitter. You think about what most Airbnbs represent. You've had clients, same thing as mine, go get one for two months while they're in between houses because they don't want to be in a hotel or it's high and they can get an Airbnb. Well, now they've rented somebody's spare bedroom for a couple of months, gave them a little cash to help subsidize their own expenses as the everything gets more expensive. It's like a win for everybody, but it only happens when we're able to look beyond a narrative and look beyond our own biases. That's a long answer to your question, but. But that's a hard, that's a hard sell. We're in town, we're in, you know, Canada's destination, the nation's capital. And we've banned more or less short-term rentals. So you need a permit. Uh, it has to be your primary residence. It can't be an accessory dwelling. It has to be for less than six months. It's got to be. It's got to be. Man, we have tourists that want to come. And not every family fits into a king or two doubles hotel room. Mine doesn't. And so when we travel around, am I going to get two hotel rooms? You know, or, or a suite or a I don't know, what am I going to, where am I going to put all these people, you know, that I drag around with me, all these, you know, ankle biters and crumb snatchers that I drag around in the, the you know, my car, where, you know, where do we fit into this stuff? And so, I don't know, those solutions are uh, 
really good for our family situation and many others. And if I feel like our city and many in Canada and maybe around here are, too, are crushing on these things. And that makes but you know, we, we saw it with the, the trucker convoy, right? Showing up is the biggest power you have. It's yeah. not about being right or being wrong or being violent or being aggressive or any of that. The power of the convoy was in showing up. And that's what we have to do as realtors. We have to show up at these meetings and say, I'd like to present to you the other side. And you might not win, but for heaven's sakes, what's happening right now on all of those regulatory things that you mentioned, it was one somebody who had a bee in their bonnet and they showed up and they gave their viewpoint. And because nobody was there to give the other side, the elected officials caved. Now, if you had 10 realtors in that room who said, well, I'd like to present to you the family who wants to come spend tourism dollars here, the seller who's in between housing, the widow who just lost her husband and isn't ready to make a decision yet. You present these alternatives and say, this is a good thing. Think about what Airbnb has done to keep people in their homes when their kids move out or they do experience a loss of a spouse and they don't have anywhere else to go. Well, now they can stay put. I mean, widow owned boarding houses were like the, the centerpiece of the hospitality industry a hundred years ago. In fact, it's the whole premise of Arsenic and Old Lace, that great Cary Grant movie. But you think about it, you couldn't do that now with some of these regulations. No. We have to be the voice of reason. But also you mentioned those permit fees, that's all cash. All of these little governments are petty thieves, basically when it comes to cash and permits. It's the same thing that happens to new builds. It happens to wanting to add an ADU. And now it's happening to Airbnbs. Realtors need to go say on behalf of your neighbors, this is my house. I'd like to do whatever I want with it, provided I'm not actually becoming a nuisance or breaking the law. And then we open up some really creative options, but showing up, that's your power, y'all. And, so, and sometimes but, it's a hard ask, right? Uh, we have people that up. can't afford a home. And so you're taking this house and you're going to rent it out once in a while to people that don't even live here, where I have 10 families that are looking for a place to live and you're you're hoarding these properties. It feels like the governments are trying, you know, we're we're just we're it's just like the realtors are changing the prices that you know landlords are definitely, you know, I'm sympathetic to that, but the cities and municipalities and, and you know governments have an opportunity to uh, do more in allowing more flexibility around building and use. And if they did all that, there'd be more for everybody. And by the way, that narrative of house hoarding makes my blood boil because that's all creative by one side of the political spectrum. And they don't want anybody to own a house. They think everybody has a right to have their own house. Housing's not a right. Your ability to own it is one of the privileges of living in a capitalistic society. It's where we have the, the ability to create our own financial future through having our little corner of dirt. And being an investor also means that you could be creating that same space for other families. And so I'm an investor. I have renters that live in some of my houses. They can't buy right now. They want somewhere to live. Great, I think I'm a better solution to that than the freaking government because the last thing we need is government housing. So we should have more mom and pop investors like me that want to provide clean, safe, decent housing and buying it in all price points. My rents are cheaper than what somebody will get from a corporate apartment building, but I have to defend my right as a landlord to own that property so that I can provide that less expensive solution so somebody else can have somewhere to live. And that's where as mom and pop investors, we need to stop calling ourselves landlords and refer to ourselves as housing providers because that's what we're doing. We're providing housing for our neighbors and we should be looking for more and more opportunities to do that because you're always gonna need a spectrum of answers, whether it's renting or owning, whether it's investment, multifamily, whether it's commercial, tiny houses, all of these things have a place in the market and that's diversity of housing. I, I hate that the word diversity has just been taken over by people who wanna do the check boxes of the immutable characteristics you're born with. The real diversity we need is in price point, socioeconomic coverage, opportunities. I mean, you, you need a lot of stuff in the marketplace to make it good. Hell, a library that only had cookbooks in it would be the most boring place on earth. But a library that has a different shelf for lots and lots of topics, you can spend days in there. For sure. It, it's funny, you talk about showing up and we had a, um, 
we have a, a we're going to give a special shout out to Tony Miller, who's basically started uh, a a group for small and medium sized landlords in our city, and he's now got a place at the city table. He's now got the ear to you know all these people because he's put himself out there. He's got them together because you know, and so uh, landlords maybe is the wrong word. The housing provider is the new one. Yeah, housing provider. But um, but you keep using the word show up, show up, show up, show up, and and I. I, you know, I, I think what you want to be saying as well is volunteer, right? And like, you've got a really good background in organized real estate. Um, you know, there's a lot like we, we're bringing you in from the States because I think there's so, so much value for us up in Canada to hear what's going on down South, but just being involved is even just a first step at, at no matter where it is at, no matter what. Well, you belong to your realtor association for a reason. And I think too many realtors want to fuss about what the association is and isn't doing, forgetting that, oh, the association is me. And so if I'm yelling about my organization, I'm kind of yelling at myself. So you better get into the room. And showing up is step one. Doing something, I think, is step two. So for a lot of realtors, if this is foreign, you're not used to advocating. You're not used to this kind of political junk we've been talking about here because this can feel overwhelming. It's so big. It's so huge. We're talking about the largest economic sector in your country and in mine. We're talking about the impact we have on our neighbors' lives, their long-term financial. <gasps> it's so big. That's why we have to do it together. And so the association has its power because it's so many thousands of us that say, you know what? We can find solutions that other people can't find because we do this every day and we take care of our neighbors every day. So you show up, find out what your trade association is doing, find out a way you can plug in, whether it's showing up for education and member events or actually joining a committee, both of those matter, and then taking it next level. But regardless of wherever we live, if you pay property taxes, you should be showing up at city council and planning meetings just to sit in the room and absorb. Because think about this, you could go to city council hear what's happening. What is Ottawa proposing for Airbnb? You might bring that back to the Realtor Association and say, hey, y'all, I didn't see anybody there who was from the association, so I'd like to make a report so y'all will know what I heard. That is as impactful as getting to the microphone as being that person who is a conduit of information and remembering that you're wearing all these hats, like you're a taxpayer and you have kids in the educational system that want to own a house one day, so you're thinking next generation and you're a professional making a living out of this, and oh my gosh, if you're a broker, other people's lives hinge on you too, you have to be involved. And by the way, if you really don't like what the association does, spoiler alert, those of us that show up make the policies. So if you wanna change things, get in the room and tell us how you've got the brilliant idea to fix everything. But if your brilliant idea consists of sitting behind Facebook and typing like this, then you're dead to me. You can only type like that if you show up. That's a rule. <laughs> That's a rule. That's a good no rule. No more exclamation points unless you are showing up at the association. <laughs> so, so how do you balance oh all these things? You're, you know, activist, realtor, and then you, you know, you're pretty transparent online about you're you and this is what I do. And you put a whole bunch of stuff online. You know, I think maybe your most viewed item that I could hunt down was an air fryer meatloaf. You know, you do so many different things, right? It's so We're good. Did you try it yet? <laughs> it's so good. And it's fast. I watched the whole thing. So, you know, like you, so we've spoken to some other people um, who have blended their art community and their realtor community and their friends and family in one. And you are, you know, you have these verticals that you've created where they're different. Uh, different channels, different ideas. You know, were you deliberate about that? You know, is air fryer meatloaf not okay? you know, to be in the same space as a listing appointment, you know, a video, like where are you on this, the, the evolution of this stuff? Okay. So spoiler alert, not everybody wants to talk about real estate all the time. Oh, I what? I know. Realtors love to talk about real estate all the time. And we think everybody else does and they don't. And so what I've discovered is that if I am something beyond a realtor, so if I'm a human and a mom and I've got my chickens and I love to cook and I show myself out running, like when I face planted and cracked all my teeth is why I have a tray right now. If I show those sides of me, then people want to know me. 
And then they find out I'm a realtor and they're like, well, you're the kind of realtor I want. And so it organically leads to a conversational business, which is the kind I love because I'm not a used car salesman. I'm an introvert by nature. I'm an INTJ for you Myers-Briggs people. And I would really rather somebody come to me than me ever have to go find them. So creating these has allowed me to let people see me without being, oh God, a realtor. And that's so why, what don't you run them, why don't you run them in one vertical? Why don't you have one channel? Well, they're all on my YouTube. They're on different playlists. But the person who wants my recipes doesn't want to watch open house videos or be motivated. They want to cook. And the person who wants to be motivated that doesn't cook, well, I mean, they still watch the cooking videos because <laughs> I'm kind of funny and they want to drink while they watch them. And that's fine, too. But that's not their jam. They want to be in this space early career realtors who find me because they got their license and they want somebody to look up to, they, they need to stay focused on real estate. And so I create playlists. They're all in the same space, but because my messaging in each one is very focused, it seems like I've built silos. I haven't built silos. I'm just focused. It's one of the things realtors are terrible at is focus. But once you figure out how to get your message consolidated, it changes everything. I learned this in politics. Of course, I've run for office twice and of course lost both times. I'm batting a thousand. But one thing you have to know in politics that we say is if you're explaining, you're losing. So that's why I go for brevity. So when you watch my videos, the only ones that really run long are either the cooking videos because people need to watch me cook. And I understand that it's a whole different space or my packing videos for conferences, which are 50 minutes long and people watch the whole 50 minutes, which I find to be weird, but okay. But everything else is in that 60 to 120 second space. Sure. That's where people are. And remember this too, you have no privacy. There's nothing left. And so trying to mush all your things together you don't have to anymore because if somebody looks me up, they're now going to see all the sides of me. And then they decide that I like, I like part of her. So maybe I'll like more of her. And in a world where we live in echo chambers, I can't tell you how many people come to me and they're like, Oh my gosh, I, how do you get away with talking about Jesus all the time? How do you get away with being a political conservative in today's world? How do you get away with you know, being a wife, oh my gosh, right? They're kind of fascinated by this. Well, everybody else has tried to dumb down their message. I live very focused in my space. Yeah. I, I first fell in love with you, how I first met you, uh, learning around love letters, right? That was, that was kind of it's my just, intro. It's not just a love letter. It's a well, real estate love letter. Okay, I'm sorry. The real estate love letter. Have you yeah, been sorry. exchanging love letters? Like there was way more to this maybe than I'm, I signed up for. Well, I'm you so know, sorry. Jody, we were going to tell it, but now that there's no privacy, we're just kidding. Nobody writes letters anymore. <laughs> well, but it was more than that, right? And it was the it was the fair housing and how, you know, when I chat with an American agent, you know, it's like, what? You're not allowed to do that? Um, so may maybe can you, for for us Canadians who have no idea on what you're allowed or not allowed to do, can you just give us a quick summary real quick? Well, I live in cancel culture. And so in cancel culture, you have a world of people who have put themselves into their own little chambers. And unfortunately, when you live in a chamber, you stop seeing all of your neighbors. And so fair housing issues in the U.S. tend to come from, go back to the early part of the conversation, the idea of the office exclusive listing. You can pick and choose who comes in your house. Well, you say you're doing it for privacy, but if you're doing it for other reasons, for discrimination racially, for familial status, for gender, for handicap, any of our US protected classes in fair housing, you now potentially have a problem because even if the seller did not intend to discriminate based on somebody's immutable characteristics, it might look like they did. And so we have this issue of most people I think are good at heart and I don't think they maliciously harm their neighbors, but they can accidentally do it because we all, every one of us is just wired to like some people and not like other people. It's just real life. It doesn't mean that in your professional real estate life, you can discriminate. And so we have these ongoing battles in the US and our agents get very confused because they really do wanna do the best thing for their clients. The market is competitive. And so they're thinking, 
I will humanize my clients so that their off their offer will win. I'll make them as lovable as possible. But when you try to make somebody lovable using their skin color and their family status and their kids and their jobs and all the stuff, you're starting to build that emotional tie. But if the seller picks based on an emotional tie that is a legally protected class, now you're in a hot water zone. And my whole point with agents is if we are serious about real estate and we're serious about private property, we should absolutely be focused on making sure that every single neighbor in every single community has access to the information so that they can make that their pathway. That's our job. We don't pick, we don't choose, we let them pick and choose their pathway, but we got to make the information available to all. When you start looking at these buyer love letters, and it was a hot topic on Clubhouse about a year ago, because that's what a lot of agents use as their differentiator, you shouldn't be using an emotional cudgel as your differentiator. Right. You should be writing better offers. That's what it boils down to. Boil it down to the terms and the numbers and the dates and those things that our immutable characteristics and the house thing are what should matter. So I can tell my sellers, look, pick the offer that fits you, not the humans that fit you because they're fairly irrelevant in this whole story. And it is a, is a maybe it's a US thing because it's visible. I'm pretty sure that all over the world, people have human biases because humans have simple hearts. But the reality is we're fighting it in the US because if anybody feels left out of the housing market, then shame on us, right? Because I want everybody to have the chance to get their first house and to get that stability that comes from it. It's, it's just a different market. But the way I look at it is, if you want to know what fair housing really means, it's that realtors believe every neighbor in every zip code should have access to the information to buy a house and the pathway period, end of discussion. It doesn't mean every neighbor in every zip code has the right to a house or the right to buy one. They have the right to get themselves on that pathway. And that's what we're working for so that they don't get roadblocked. Maybe it wasn't you, but I, 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 I was pretty sure it was. I told Jody that it was, but I remember you telling me a story. And I'm, again, I'm pretty sure it was you, so I could be wrong. Um, where you even, you even told us this story of that you redacted the names on the agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like, names like, trigger biases too. Yes. Like, and you know, we, we don't even think about that here, right? I'm going to well, sit there. I'm going to drive down the street. I'm going to tell my buyers, yeah, don't buy there. You're not going to like it. I, you know, like the, the stuff that we don't even think about that we're doing is insane to me. Well, and you know, like I said, I don't think people are malicious. I really don't. I think they're trying to figure out how to help people get the best possible living scenario for themselves. Some neighborhoods have crime we should be able to tell them this neighborhood has crime. However, that's now perceived as biased. And so all I can give them is the resources, go to the sheriff's department website and you ask them and then you let me know. And, and I don't like that I can't give them the information I have, but I understand, right? Because there are people out there that will take it and twist it and turn it because they need to check so bad. I don't need to check that bad. I need to make sure that I'm protecting the housing market and protecting my neighbors. And so I did start taking the names off of offers because Charlotte, North Carolina is a very diverse market. Like we're a melting pot and I freaking love that about this here because I got neighbors from everywhere. However, some names will tell people, well, that person comes from a culture that may or may not negotiate in the way that I'm accustomed to because that happens a lot. There's a particular international culture whose focus is on negotiating. That's how they roll. And any seller who says, I am firm, there's just already dissonance with that culture. So if they see that name, they're going to start making assumptions like, you know what? Wipe the names out. That's offer one. This is offer two. And now they look at it differently and not making so many assumptions. And it is what it is. I'm going to do the best I can to protect and preserve my sellers so they get the best possible real estate and preserve every buyer so they get the best possible opportunity. That's amazing. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. But we're humans. We're not meant to be perfect, but Jesus can save all of us. <laughs> so on that note, I think, I think we've taken enough of your time. We've, we've only got like yes. a little bit blocked for you. So thank you so much. Uh, any final things you want to you wanna say real quick? Well, how do we get a hold of you? How do we follow you? All that stuff. Well, I'm Lee Brown. 
And that's LeeBrown.com or of course, Lee Thomas Brown on Facebook and Instagram because you got to use your maiden name so all your old friends from forever can find you because you're in real estate, can't be a secret agent. <laughs> and I am delighted to help you. If you were trying to figure out how to plug into the political advocacy scene, I helped when Korea was getting there started. I think the first province that got it up and running was Ontario and I was helping Tria with that. That's back when Ray and Amy, Ray Ferris was president. I love Ray and Amy. They're wonderful friends of mine. And I'm delighted to help you get plugged into your resources. Even though I'm an American, I'm pretty good with my Canucks. And if you invite me to BAMP, as soon as they get rid of the VAX mandates, I'm on my way because I freaking love Lake Louise. And I'm glad to be a resource for you. But the thing I need you to take forward into your marketplace, markets are fluid. You have to have a skill set, take more classes, find more mentors. You have to open doors. And when I say open doors, tell other people that real estate's an amazing profession and that we should be more respected for the professionals we are. And that means you also have to open doors to your neighbors. And so whoever your neighbors are, if they say, I'm interested in real estate, you say, great, here's a pathway. Help them go down that pathway. And the third thing is, you didn't create the market we're in. I know it sucks some days and I know it's exciting some days to find an outlet that has nothing to do with real estate, whether it's cooking or some chickens or going for walks and runs, be something besides a realtor so that you can keep the realtor side filled up and you can take care of yourself as well because it all adds up. Amazing. Let's combine the two and we'll do chicken advocacy. There we go. Yes. Do you have chickens, Jody? You seem very interested in my chickens. I, ha I have chickens. Uh, Matt was hosted some of my chickens maybe for a couple of years. We're not, uh, we're not allowed yeah. to though. So we're not, we're not allowed to in the city. We so don't we heard, really talk about, about it. it. There's a we don't have chicken chickens. society, I think somewhere. That's, Do you have uh, guineas? No, no. Okay, because I'm looking to add guineas because I heard they're good watchdogs. And so if I add some, I'll report back and you do the same. Deal. Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Lee Brown. I really appreciate you being here with us today. You are amazing as always. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you more. Seeing you in person. You guys. Thanks yeah. for all oh, that you're yeah. doing and I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks great. So Thank you.